Good evening conference. to one and all we'll and welcome you all. And very good evening to one and all. This is a pre-session as a part of our upcoming series on pain management techniques, SHIPRA, which mainly deals with trigger point therapy and it starts on May 16. Today, we have a talk on osteopathy in clinical practice by Dr. Shine Mohan Palapulli. He's a founder, Samanya to integrate workshop series and chief physician in Ayurveda, Talapulli Palaka. Sir, we welcome you wholeheartedly to the session and thank you so much for being a part of this series. Hello, sir. Thank you, doctor. Uh, can you hear me now? Can you see me now? Yeah, so we can start now. Okay. Okay, so let's start. Good evening, one and all. Uh, thank you so much for taking your time out, uh, you know, uh, almost start of the weekend. And uh, I'm here to present uh, my views on a very interesting topic that I got to learn, you know, when, when I started exploring different types or different treatment modalities. And uh, uh, it's been a journey of 11 years since I left college and, you know, I've been exploring a lot of different type of uh, treatment methods and uh, now I've really found it very interesting. I found it very exciting. I really found it a lot of uh, use in my clinical practice. And uh, it, it is in the science of osteopathy that I got to connect all these techniques and, uh, and I really feel that doctors should know what it is. Uh, you know, because it will play a different uh, role. It will be completely different. Your whole attitude, your whole uh, uh, method of treatment will change once you start applying these techniques or the principles of osteopathy. Uh, so let's begin the session. I always begin my session by paying my homage to my ancestors, uh, my great grandfather, Sri Talapuli Krishan Vaidil, who founded the tradition uh, at Talapuli and uh, you know this is a very uh, a picture that is always close to my heart and this is something that I always uh, been very proud of. Uh, this photo is of a person who is about 85, 88 years old uh, you know he's from a town a very known a very senior person and you know he he's a family friend and uh, it was in about five years ago that uh, he came to me as a patient, like for a back pain. He came to me for a low back pain. And that was the first time I was having a patient-doctor relationship with him. And it wasn't during this time that he shared a lot of his experiences and, you know, with, with my grandfather and great-grandfather. So there was a lot of, uh, you know, knowledge and there's a lot of inspiring stories uh, that I heard through him. And... Uh, this particular photo is uh, the spot in his ear uh, when he, he says that when he was about four or five years old, you know, when he came to my uh, great grandfather for uh, an acute colic pain, uh, he did Agni Karma using a shalaka on the ear. So I was astonished because we've been using Agni Karma uh, for conditions like, you know, tennis elbow, we've been using for plantar fasciitis, for pain, and we all know how effective it is. But we always focus on the uh, local application of Agni Karma, wherever there is a site of pain. So this was really a new thing to me, you know, for a pain that is there around your stomach area, you're doing Agni Karma in the ear. And it is mentioned in our classics, you know, but we don't really uh, practice it. For Grahani, it is mentioned Agni Karma, but, uh, you know, and it was really surprising and it was really, I was really wondered to know that you know such practices existed before and somehow through our you know the institutionalization of uh, ayurveda or bams uh, you know many such things those practices uh, have been lost and 
so that's that's what keeps me inspiring you know i i always tell myself there is so much to explore there's so much to learn and uh, this is a uh, photo of my grandfather his name is sri ramakutty vaidyar you know very famous physician and a lot of uh, people came to him uh, you know for studying and uh, our house was like a small gurukulam uh, this is my grandfather's brother dr t k oni uh, he is a uh, after his basic studies in ayurveda he went out and he did an mbbs was uh, he retired as a district medical officer a dmo and he was the first one to do vasectomy in our district so and and people who are about 60 70 80 years old in my town you know most of the persons you know he would have, he he was the one who conducted their deliveries etc so you know a lot of people have a lot of attachment and i hear great stories of them so that's something that's keep me really blessed to be uh, you know a part of this family and tradition and uh, to our topic now what is osteopathy osteopathy as a definition is based on the principle that the well being of an individual depends on the skeleton muscles ligaments and connective tissues functioning smoothly together uh, which clearly uh, in simple terms uh, it means that function uh, affects the structure and structure affects the function which means the entire musculoskeletal condition conditions you know uh, all the entire musculoskeletal system which includes your muscles your bones your ligaments uh, you know connective tissues everything right from your head to your toe needs to be in uh, functioning smoothly only then you know our body uh, will also body's function will also be normal so which means the structure affects the function and as well as vice versa the function affects the structure Uh, the founder of osteopathy uh, was known as Andrew Taylor Still, and uh, this is a very interesting uh, picture of him. As you can see, uh, I want you to focus on the area behind the, uh, you know, just behind his neck. You can see that. So basically, uh, Andrew Taylor Still, when he was uh, he was a farmer's son, and when he was small, he used to get this uh, headache, you know, terrible headaches. and uh, once you know he wanted to take rest under a tree and so what he did was uh, he tied a rope right and then he put a blanket around it earlier he tied it little higher but then he was not very comfortable and then he just tied it about 8 to 10 inches off the ground and when he tied this uh, rope and he put a blanket over it and he rest his head Uh, you know just just below the occipital you know, suboccipital region he he kept his head and he was just lying down and uh, you know surprisingly he says that you know there is a small story that he says uh, every time uh, he laid like this you know his you can see i lay stretched on my back with my neck across the rope soon i became easy and went to sleep uh, got up in a little while with headache all gone and uh, at those times he did not know anything about anatomy and uh, i took no note thought of how a rope could stop headache and six stomach which accompanied it so what he's trying to say is that uh, he was having whenever he had uh, a severe headache he also had uh, you know a, a digestion issue along with it and whenever he tied this rope and when he rested you know he could uh, the headache was relieved and also at the same time the six stomach which accompanied with it also eased and after that discovery i rope my neck whenever i felt those spells coming on i followed that treatment for 20 years before the wedge of reason reached my brain and i could see that i had suspended the action of the great occipital nerves and given harmony to the flow of arterial blood to and through the veins and this was the effect as a reader can see now this is what uh he after learning uh, you know when he went to an uh, osteopathy school and he uh, this is what he understood uh, because he had suspended the action of the occipital nerves and he was giving harmony to the blood flow to the you know the head and uh, that's what led to a lot of study in osteopathy and it's been a uh, lot of inputs and a lot of research has been going on uh, in it and a knowledge of anatomy is only a dead weight if we do not know how to apply that knowledge with successful skill and uh, you know when i first uh, read that and i said it is really true because uh, in 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 our curriculum we we study anatomy you know we we 
study anatomy in a first year and then from from the second year or the third year is more into you know treatment and chikilsa or nidana or so, or those aspects we don't really uh, focus so much on the anatomy or the structural anatomy as such uh, we study about you know medicine we, we, we refer a lot of you know the uh, conditions uh, we understand the modern aspect of it but i'm talking about the very basic anatomy because when you are dealing with uh, a structural condition or a musculoskeletal condition we need to apply uh, you know there is applied anatomy uh, etc that needs to be uh, understood and applied in every case that we see and uh, thorough knowledge about muscles and its action absolutely essential for treating musculoskeletal conditions i'm sure everything doctors you know we have a lot of people who uh, run these uh, spine and uh, you know specialty clinics and you know a lot of people doing a lot of good uh, you know treatments but i feel that you know applying uh, the knowledge of osteopathy along with our uh, you know uh, science you know it has given me that extra edge in treating many of the conditions uh, you know faster and more effective the sharing to loan okay yeah i know now okay yeah, no, okay. yeah, I think uh, I think by mistake I just clicked something. Okay, so uh, and knowledge about trigger points is essential to effectively treat the different conditions of the muscles. Now, uh, again, uh, you know we've been uh, dealing with uh, just a second. Okay. We are really doctors, you know, have been dealing with you know these structures or these principles that we mentioned in osteopathy you know and that is something that we'll be doing throughout with uh, you know with our practice and it's not something that we uh, understand and do it for example uh, we there are a lot of doctors senior doctors who develop you know who have developed various techniques over their period of practice you know and it was something that they developed like special massage techniques for special conditions uh, and and you know when you understand more about osteopathy and when you learn a lot uh, a lot in osteopathy you realize that there are actually very interesting structures that you know that are very specific and uh, we can understand those points very easily and uh, trigger points or some these uh, mic is on okay uh, and knowledge about trigger points is essential to effectively treat the different conditions of the muscle. Now, uh, when we uh, treat, you know, when, when somebody comes to us, you know, a lot of people come with different sort of different types of pain and they, they are very specific about the pain that they have. And sometimes it's, you know, as Ayurvedic doctors, we, we usually take it as, you know, is it uh, vata or you know if there is a lot of inflammation then we consider spitta and if there's uh, stiffness it's kapha for us so and based on that we give medicines but in our shastras it has been specifically mentioned that you know, when you talk about the parikshas it, it is said that there is the darsana, sparsana and prasna so the sparsana aspect or the sparsana pariksha is something that you know uh, got lost in between and we really don't touch and feel or we don't really try to understand what the condition is and you know when once i learned more about trigger points when i got a chance to learn about trigger points it was all always hands-on techniques for me i was trying to find these various spots in the body and i must tell you that you know a lot of people found it more uh, effective a lot of people really felt that uh, you know the doctor was actually addressing the real issue uh, and you know that itself builds a lot of confidence for these patients. So, what are these trigger points? You know, uh, and why is it necessary that we should understand what is a myofascial trigger point? Because myofascial trigger points or MTPs are present everywhere and affects as much as 85% of the population at some time in their life. So everybody has trigger points now. Uh, and it is also present in babies and children. 
and the impact of myofascial pain on health can be severe as patients not only suffer from pain and loss of function but also from impaired mood and decreased quality of life and i'm sure many of doctors who are present today would have felt in your clinical practice that you know there was certain pain that uh, you know even sometimes we didn't have uh, you know answer to uh, people would go to an uh, you know modern medicine doctor they would take you know painkiller injections and even with the painkiller injections you know they would say that you know they didn't get the proper relief or uh, it was just a temporary relief and then when they come to us you know we we are giving them different kinds of uh, massages and we are using different kinds of potlies and stuff uh, you know dharas uh, tailadara kashayadara all all sort of things we do and uh, you know and and there, there are certain conditions there are certain moments you know when people uh, sometimes even don't feel much better with, with those treatments as well and uh, you know it will be just like what do you say uh, increasing the treatment duration uh, you know a lot of cases when when we do a 14 day or a 21 uh, day course and people feel slightly better and you know we hope they get better during that uh, you know the resting period but then they come to us again after three or four months, uh, you know, uh, with these complaints. So there are there are very uh, specific structures within the body, uh, within phenomena that we need to understand to effectively treat pain. And these these conditions of trigger point pain, especially, uh, you know, it decreases the mood and especially the quality of life. People feel so, you know, uh, disheartened. They feel so depressed you know with, with the pain they have and anyone who touches the body should have a thorough and deep knowledge of trigger points so just a basic idea of a trigger point you know i'll just uh, quickly brush up your anatomy on the uh, muscles and you know so you know the the basic unit of muscle is the actin and myosin filaments right and just small strands and these actin and myosin filaments they combine to form what is called as a myofibril and these myofibrils they combine to form the muscle fiber the muscle fiber combines to form the fascicles and the fascicles combine to form the belly of the muscle and uh, you can see that each the muscle fiber is covered by the endomysium the fascicle is covered by the perimysium and the belly of the muscle is covered by the epimysium so it's basically uh, bundles you know bundles upon bundles together and and you know a set of uh, muscle fiber is has a covering a layer which is called as the endomysium and then the fascicles th those bundle in, in lot of bundles it's called as the fascicle and it's uh, covered by with the perimysium and the bundle of fascicles which is combined together with the form the belly of the muscle and that has a covering which is called as the epimysium and we should understand this you know the the bundle within the bundles and the uh, connecting the layer surrounding it and you can see that the epimysium is continuous with the bone or the periosteum of the bone so and this is the structure what we call as like you know like fascia i'll be talking more about it and this is how it is connected throughout the body uh, and uh, the, we know basically there are different types of the basically the three types of muscles uh, you know the smooth cardiac and skeletal muscle and you know the smooth muscles for your internal organs cardiac for the heart and skeletal muscle is for the rest of the body and uh, you know the sliding filament model we talk about the actin and myosin filaments i'm sure you know it's just a quick brush up so if you want you know uh, to start learning about trigger points the basic things you need to understand are the sliding filament model to understand how a trigger point is formed and the basic anatomy of the uh, muscle fiber so you can check it online you can go to youtube there are a lot of uh, you know videos available so a quick brush up again you know the nerve impulses arrive at the axon terminal of the motor neuron and you know uh, this is the nerve impulse arrives and then the acetylcholine enzyme diffuses and you know uh, what happens is the change uh, in, in, in the action potential makes the actin and myosin filaments to actually slide over each other. The sarcomeres contract and there is a sliding which is called as the sliding filament model and this is what helps in the contraction of the muscle. So whenever there is a sarcomere contraction you know the muscle fiber 
a kind of contracts and it for some reason it gets stuck forming a small nodule and then when that is not treated this affects the uh, subsequent fibers which is around it and uh, becoming into a bigger nodule uh, what is the trigger point it's a highly irritable localized spot of exquisite tenderness a nodule in a palpable taut band of a muscle skeleton so when there is uh, you know the sliding filament there is movement of actin and myosin filament and the entire muscle fiber becomes very uh, thickened so it's like you'll find a small nodule which is along a string of band so the best the best place that everyone would have a trigger point is actually here right so you can just take your hand you can just keep you know try to on on the middle trapezius you know just put your hand like this and uh, you can press and feel can you feel some stiffness there can you feel some pain at least you know five or ten people if you see you can just send me a chat can you just uh, keep your fingers like this and press and see if you get any sort of stiffness and it's, it's a very common point you know and people come and tell us i'm not able to see everyone's screen so did somebody see it can somebody feel it on your own body yes i got one reply that's for me Harsh Kambod. Okay. Anybody else? Because this is a very common spot, right? Every your patient comes to you with, you know, uh, and and the presenting. Uh, I would call it tenderness in Ghana. Yes, tenderness. Tenderness on the doctor. Then then if our pain, our palatal to touch him, but stiffness on another pain on it. And so it's like uh, this is a very very common spot, and here is where you know. This, this spot is present in almost everyone because you know the kind of posture we sit in or the kind of work we always do you know and uh, this is nothing but a trigger point of your middle trapezius and, I'll be watching. okay and uh, when, when we uh, press and see and and you know you have a lot of patients coming us coming to us you know they all complain like this you know and and they say that you know when they try to uh you put some force and do it and they feel a lot of relief etc so this is what we're trying to do and you know try to understand what this phenomenon is so this is basically the trigger points of the middle trapezius and how do we treat it i'll just give you a quick uh, intro in this session so the coin trigger point uh was uh the term trigger point was coined by dr janet travel and david simmons a very famous book on trigger point therapy by travel and simmons it's called you know you can get the pdfs online and they were the ones who actually started doing uh, a lot of work on trigger points and you know fascia and uh, things like that so my official trigger points are those trigger points that are found in a specific muscle and its facial wrapping so you have a trigger point in a one particular muscle fiber it spreads to subsequent uh, muscle fibers and then you know the whole muscle becomes stiff so there's a video which explains it. We'll probably. Very few people thought of these problems are often related to trigger. Points. Understanding and treating trigger points helps to less pain and improve overall health. This video is a short explanation and introduction to the trigger point. A tra Point is a small muscle contraction which can be felt as a small nodule. Pushing on this nodule is very painful. Trigger points can exist in each muscle of the body. Multiple can exist at the same time. Often both sides of the body are affected equally. The trigger point keeps the muscle tight and weak, restricting the muscle's range of motion. The trigger point can actually cause pain or it can cause no pain unless touched. Mostly this pain is sent to a different area of the body.
this. But also a different segment now becomes stretched by this tension, shown by the greater distance between the sarcomeres. Together, multiple sarcomere knots form the trigger trigger point. The stretch segments of the fibers give tightness to the taut band in which the trigger point lies. When sarcomeres are stuck in contraction, blood flow stops in the immediate area. The resulting oxygen starvation and accumulation of waste products irritate the trigger point. The trigger point responds by sending out pain signals. In return, your brain will stimulate you to stop using the muscle which further shortens and tightens up the muscle. Trigger points will not release without proper treatment. The most effective way to treat a trigger point is applying a deep stroking massage directly to the trigger point. This can be done without the help of others. Deep stroking massage means performing a series of deep strokes across the trigger point nodule. In this example, a rubber bouncing ball is placed between the body and the ball to reach the trigger point in the lower trapezius on the back side of the body. You can see the ball moving slowly and deeply, short strokes from one side of the trigger point to the other. The series typically consists of about 8 to 12 strokes and are performed about 5 to 10 times a day. By using deep stroking massage, you are milking the trigger point, so to speak. Blood and lymph fluid is moved out containing waste generated by the contracted muscle fibers. Each time you move over the trigger point and release the pressure, fresh blood immediately flows in, bringing fresh oxygen and nutrients. It may take several weeks to return the muscle fibers to their normal state and fully release the trigger point. Trigger points which have existed for a long time may take a lot of treatment, but after results can be achieved in days, meaning less pain and improved mobility. You can find references to more in-depth information about trigger points and their treatment in the video description below. This video is uh, available online. You can get it on YouTube. Uh, Many people suffer from pain. Eh? Uh, I hope everybody was able to see the video. It's basically an explanation. Uh, you know, was everyone able to see it? Can somebody raise hands? You know, just somebody said there was no voice in between. Yeah, I think uh, when I tried to plug in my earphone there was an issue. Were you able to see the video? Okay. Many people suffer from pain and physical problem. So it's basically here is what tight strength uh, muscle that what, feels like a core. You know, a muscle fiber, you know, you can see very clear, very clear animation. For tendon. Both can be felt the sarcomeres acting like tiny pumps have to contract to create movement, contracted state. Why because of this? But also uh, these are the individual muscle fibers, and you can see the sarcomere contraction and uh, it kind of gets stuck. And you know, and when that is not treated or when it is left alone you know there is a tightness in the subsequent muscle fibers and then the green color represents the stagnation or the improper circulation or the inflammation uh, in the body and uh, the best technique that we usually use are actually compression techniques you know there are a lot of methods you know uh, this is a very common thing this is like a self-help techniques all the athletes, you know, uh, nowadays they understand what is a trigger point, and you know there are a lot of self-help techniques that they, you know, the, the physios teach them because it's not easy, you know, because this is very important for them in their recovery. So somebody who is doing a lot of, uh, uh, you know, research in sports medicine and Ayurveda, uh, this is definitely a topic that you should really look into. So. Uh, uh, I'll just give you examples in certain muscles, you know, where there is a trigger point. You can see the blue dots actually represent the trigger point. So you have the upper trigger point and you have the trigger point in the middle trapezius and the trigger point in the lower trapezius. And, you know, the interesting part of trigger points is the pain map that we see. 
the blue color uh, shows where there is a trigger point and the red color denotes the pain map associated with it and this is the most tricky part so uh, people having trigger points you know somewhere here but they always feel there is a pain slightly above or slightly below and uh, on 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 the right hand side corner you could see uh, you know somebody who has a trigger, trigger point on this side which is the upper fibers of the trapezius sometimes the pain radiates from the ear and into the forehead right so it's this whole area and uh, you know most people nowadays they have because this is uh, uh, you know that muscle that we usually use to sit forward you know just bend when you flex your head when you use your computer too much you know this this becomes overstretched and this is the area where there's a lot of strain so the you need to understand the origin and an insertion in the muscle because we need to understand how to do stretches so uh, just the basic you know uh, the origin is the medial third of the superior nuchal line of occiput the external of, uh, occipital protuberance and the ligamented nucleus so here's the origin of the trapezius muscle and the insertion the spinous process and uh, sorry on the border of the lateral third of the clavicle right the medial border of acromion and the upper border of the crust of the chest so what does a trapezius muscle do it actually holds the scapula right and gives uh, stabilizes our shoulder joint so what are the action it it pulls the girdle up prevents the depression of the shoulder so when when somebody comes to us you know for certain conditions when they say you know uh, they're not able to lift the hand or sometimes they say that they are able to lift the hand to one particular level but they're not able to lift it beyond certain level you know all sort of conditions and so we need to understand what are the muscles involved which muscle is affected and then we go and search or check for trigger points or any sort of uh, you know imbalance in that particular muscle so that's the trapezius and you have the scalenes and scalenes are you know three uh, scalenes anterior medius and posterior on the side of the neck because uh, very common especially uh, you know in conditions like torticollis it's the scalenes and the so sternocleum master that is most affected the origin is from the transverse process of the cervical vertebrae and the insertion is the anterior and medius first rib and second rib so what what does it do it actually flexes the neck because you know and it lifts the ribs while uh, you know inhalation and uh, and in, in today's conditions you know people when they get these trigger points you know what the pain radiates to the front of the chest to the hands and uh, many people uh, get scared because they find they feel you know it could be uh, some sort of angina you know and and when they come to us we feel that you know we when we find out that it's just trigger point because what happens is they, they have this severe chest pain and a pain radiating towards the chest towards the hand and uh, you know when they go to a modern medicine doctor or you know any clinics when they take the ECG it's normally no uh, the ECG is normal but the patient is having severe pain and you know that's when the doctors even uh, don't get a final answer to it and that's when, when they come to us right so uh, we need to have a differential diagnosis is it a, a trigger point on the scalings that is giving a small a symptom like that right and the spinous capitals uh, you know the muscle on the posterior side of the neck and you can see uh, i just want to mention these uh, you know quickly mention these muscles and go because you know we need to understand today a lot of people are sitting working from home overuse of the neck overuse of the uh, neck flexors and they're not able to you know take breaks and a lot of companies are giving them overwork and they're sitting at home and you know i'm getting a lot of patients who are uh, developing a lot of complications because of the improper posture in their houses right uh, because in, in office they have proper office chair and table but in house they do make it do uh, do with uh, what do you say uh, a dining chair or, or just a normal bench or something so a lot of people have a lot of difficulties these days so it's important that we understand this condition then you have the rhombus major minor you know very common in between the scapula people always come and tell you know there is a severe pain there and uh, you know we need to understand so what are trigger point characteristic you know the trigger points are always at a single point a nodule is embedded within a torso so when you try to uh, 
what do you say palpate and find out so basically when there is a muscle fiber right you always palpate on the perpendicular to the muscle fiber and then we sometimes find these knots or nodules right and then we see this knot is present in a tight band it's like a string or a cord right and uh, the best part is the pressure reproduces the pain symptoms with radiation and specific knife so when when you find a trigger point and when you press it right uh, you will be able to reproduce the same pain that the patient is complaining of and that's the most interesting part of trigger point therapy people come to you with headaches you know one side of the head uh, you know they go online they see it's uh, you know migraine and things like that and you know they take a lot of medications and nothing is effective and and they come to us and we find out there are these trigger points when we press on these trigger points you know they get that exact pain what they have been feeling and you know that's that's really a magical thing for them as well because they feel that oh the doctors actually found out what my problem is and and, and when we then release it almost instantly that pain is relieved and the best part is pain cannot be explained by findings from a neurological examination uh, or any sort of investigations we will not be able to identify these trigger points and because of that it's a complete hands-on technique and you know you really feel like you know uh, what do you say like a healer you feel the magic in your hands when when you actually treat trigger points and it helps a lot in boosting your confidence and it may induce autonomic changes and here's what how it gets connected because there is uh, the muscle is tied bef before there is because there is stiffness in that particular muscle you know it, it com somebody saying audio is not clear uh, is my audio clear or is it just with one person sir it's clear you can carry on okay 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 thanks okay i think it's to do with uh, the network in the particular you know whichever area because some people can hear it some people cannot okay uh, I think this is being recorded, Doctor. Yes, yeah, sir, think, it's recorded. Yeah, so probably you can share the recorded link afterwards. As well. So, how can we find them? You know, there are just uh, specific techniques on how to find trigger point based on the depth of the muscle or the muscle fiber that we want to address. You know, use a finger pad if it's very on the superficial line like fat finger and then there is pincer palpation technique that you use for your sternocleidomastoid right the sternocleidomastoid is it, the origins from the sternum the clavicle and then to the mastoid process so it's the sternocleidomastoid the scm muscle this is how you palpate and find for trigger points right and then and you press and you find if there is a trigger point and then you treat it and then you also sometimes use elbow if there is a person is very stout person and if you know he has a, a thick a well-built muscle so you need more pressure there are also tools that we actually use or trigger point tools so once we find it is a trigger point you know what are the techniques that we use to treat one is injections uh, very rarely people use injections on trigger point the most common thing that we use are dry needling so dry needling is nothing but just uh, using an acupuncture needle for we identify the trigger point and then we insert uh, a needle and keep it there for some time and see that trigger point gets uh, you know treated almost in, in about 10 to 15 minutes and then there is the spray and stretch technique when you stretch that particular muscle then you apply uh, spray and then there are the hands-on techniques that I've been saying stretch and release techniques so i'll just uh, go through the hands-on techniques you know one is the inhibition compression technique where you identify the trigger point when you hold uh, you know when you compress hold for five seconds release again hold for five seconds and release so that's called as a compression technique so what that does is you're actually breaking that hardness and stiffness in that particular muscle and you're literally dissolving the trigger point uh, you use a lot of different type of tools like you know uh, something hard uh, there are a lot of like handmade tools that we use uh, to release these trigger points uh, we use cupping dry cupping has been found very effective in trigger point therapy 
uh, deep stroking massage, like just on the video when we saw a person rolling over a ball, you know, and similarly we, we use our hands and specific steps that we need to do in, in massage and the manual lymphatic drainage. And, you know, when we release uh, the complete, uh, uh, what do you say, the, the congestion in, in the muscle and then we aid the circulation in the muscle. So we need to understand how uh, you know the musculoskeletal works. So when we talk about trigger points, it's always the trigger point in one particular muscle. And then we should understand that you know for when you're considering a joint, you know skeletal muscles work together to create and reverse movements, right? And for that we need we 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 have learned about the, the types of you know the action in in one particular joint. You have the agonist muscle, you have the antagonist muscles, and you have the synergies. So just a quick brush up again, you know, when there is a muscle that does the main function and the other muscle that actually does a reverse function and the another muscle, the synergist, which actually supports it. So basically when you're flexing the elbow, right, you have the muscle, uh, the biceps, which actually are the agonist muscle. You have the antagonist muscle as the triceps, because like I said, uh, you know, the muscle only contracts, it, it does not have the function to relax itself. So basically when the biceps contracts, you know, uh, the triceps relaxes and when, when you contract the triceps, that's when the bicep relaxes. So this, this function has to be understood because when people come to us with any sort of range of motion uh, issues, you know, we need to understand what are the set of muscles that is involved there and we need to uh, identify those muscles and we need to check for trigger points in those muscles. So it's it's not, it's, it's, it's this is here where we get, you know, a holistic approach of treatment. So again, the stretch reflex arc and the reciprocal inhibition, just we have studied all that, you know, when, when the impulse come and when there is flexion of here, they have given an example of the quadriceps and the hamstring muscles, right? When there is a uh, you know, stimulation in the quadriceps, it kind of contracts, you know, extending the knee while relaxing the uh, hamstring. So again, when the hamstring contracts, the knee flexes by extending the uh, quadriceps as well. So when, when people are having difficulty in movement with either flexion or uh, extension of the knee joint, we need to consider both the quadriceps as well as the hamstring. So that's the whole idea, right? And uh, for neck pain, when we approach in, in a trigger point view, what do we do? Uh, when people come to us with headache, we identify the anatomical structures that is present in all the muscles. We consider the trapezius, rhomboid, spinal major, splenius capitis, and then, and then once we understand all the muscle that is involved, then we try to identify the pain or the trigger point on, on certain muscles, right? So we check for the uh, middle trapezius where there is trigger points. We find there is a trigger point in the middle trapezius and we do an ischemic compression technique, the ICT that I just said. And when you press for five seconds, release, and again, five uh, press for five seconds and release. And then you slide down to the rhomboids. We need to look into the trapezius. We need to look into the rhomboids. I'm talking about neck pain here. And then we finally locate the trigger points in the scalenes group right, you release, and then the uh, trigger points in the uh, splenius capitis muscle. And then once we release the trigger points, we just massage the area, and then again, uh, you release the uh, muscles in the just posterior part of your neck, the posterior cervical muscles. And also finally, in the occipital frontalis, you know, it's, it's a very, uh, what do you say, a tender point, it's a very sensitive point, especially when people have headaches, you know, when you try to press it, they tell you how, how much severe pain it is. So these are, uh, when you understand these specific points, what happens is people feel that we are understanding their problems as well. So that helps a lot in connecting with the patient. And, you know, once you release that, once you release the trigger points and then you can do some proper massage and then you can teach them about, you know, various stretch techniques. So in neck pain, you know, this is what we do. We give a towel stretch, you know, which takes care of the upper back, lower back, and you have the flexor stretch, you know, you're just releasing the trapezius, rhomboids, etc. You have the neck stretch, which is a very good stretch for your 
scalenes and sternocleidomastoid and your trapezius, your sternocleidomastoid, all these stretches that you actually generally do. So from now on, once we understand the trigger points, we are actually, you know, remembering, thinking about which muscle should be uh, given proper stretches, etc. And chin tuck. Uh, I just chose this point because it is very relevant. You know, you can just uh, start considering it in your practice right from tomorrow itself. Uh, a small uh, history about President John F. Kennedy. You know, according to his mother, he was a very sick little boy, nearly died of scarlet fever at two years. He had whooping cough at five years, digestive problems at 14 years, and uh, diagnosed of hyperthyroidism at 17 years. And at 30 years, you know, he had a spinal accident and he was almost bedridden. And uh, this is a picture of uh, Dr. Janet Travel, you know, the lady with him. And uh, she was the one who treated him because a lot of doctors did not understand what the kind And she applied the principle of trigger points and she found out the pain map in his body and then uh, you know she treated him accordingly and uh, you know when he was the president she was appointed as the chief physician in, in the white house that was you know uh, first time when somebody from outside you know gets uh, appointed by the president himself and uh, that that's how important uh, you know these uh, uh, trigger points and uh, these my myofascial pain syndromes are and when you consider about you know the trigger points we understand that single muscle fiber we understand which muscle it is in and then we understand which joint is involved and we also consider the agonist antagonist muscles within that joint right and when you're talking about particular joint you can see it is connected throughout the body by what is known as a structure called fascia and fascia is a place to look for the cause of the disease and a place to consult and begin the action of remedies in all diseases because your fascia is something that connects you know everything together right from your head to your toes if you remember the uh, anatomy of the muscle fiber you had the uh, coverings you know the perimysium epimysium and the endomysium like which is covering of the each individual bundles and then which is continuous with the body one simple example is you know when when uh, we, we consider according to ayurvedic principles we have the uh, hair the roma and naka as the uh, mala of the astadatu and and we know that whenever there is uh, whenever there is a fracture or something immediately people have uh, you know hair fall etc and uh, even if it's it's so it's not something like a hair fall a fracture in the skull bone only that gives hair fall in you know gives hair fall but even if you have a fractured leg you know it gives a hair fall and the main reason being is it is connected throughout with the fascia so fascia is something a structure that is you know responsible for a lot of functions in the body a lot of function related to movements you know a lot of function uh, related to circulation of body fluids etc but you know when when we learn about uh, when we do dissection in in our syllabus you know we learn dissection on a cadaver but while we are treating or or, or anatomy we do a dissection on a dead body but when we are treating live human body it's completely a different phenomenon uh, the fascia is literally just cut and removed and we don't really uh, you know understand what it is all we do look for is the muscles nerves and arteries and veins all the specific structure that is mentioned in the books that's what we try to identify but when you're talking about living person you know fascia plays a bigger role than all the structures that we just mentioned so uh once we start learning once we start you know doing it uh, we, we understand more and more about the fascination you know the fascinating world in fascia so what is fascia? Fascia in general is a covering and uh, myofascia is a dense tough tissue which surrounds and covers all of our muscles and bones. So uh, it helps transport, move chemical and other substances around the body and myofascia connects many of the areas of the body together and also uh, referred to as a connective tissue. And uh, you know this is why we have that term connective tissue because uh, we realize that in, in fascia, you know, it connects one muscle to uh, another group of muscle and it is continuous. And uh, the best example of, you know, how a fascia work is, especially when you do like uh, certain uh, martial arts, like, you know, karate or kaladi or, you know, a lot of martial arts. So there are specific 
locking techniques that they teach you to defend you know when, when somebody or you know with some even you don't need a lot of power but you just need some techniques and when then people come and twist somebody's hand and then you know the opponent is not even able to move his hand because you know when when these people when they are actually uh, just twisting in that particular point what happens is is actually engaging their entire fascia and which restricts the movement and this person cannot even move and you know and if you're a marma practitioner you have been doing dealing with uh, fascia all this while without actually calling what is a fascia so if you've been into so this is something that is uh, you know a lot of people like manual therapists a lot of people like marma ideas all these people give a lot of importance to and it's high time even we understand it because when we are dealing with human body you know it is uh, necessary that we understand all the uh, you know phenomena that is happening in the body so the myofascial meridian you know or specific set of meridian that a very good study that is done by thomas myers in his book called the anatomy trains and i'm sure a lot of people are hearing it over and over again because it's very important uh, this is how you connect uh, you know the entire body first you begin with the muscles now we're talking about the covering of these muscles and uh, the meridian maps may help to explain how and why the development of primary central trigger points in one area of the body may lead to a secondary or satellite trigger points so what happens is sometimes a trigger point is formed in your upper back and then so you can see that and when that is not left treated you know along the fascia or the facial covering there is another trigger point that is actually formed so i'll just give you a few examples of you know the uh, different myofascial meridians or the anatomy trains. Uh, the first one is the front arm line. You know, it begins with the latissimus dorsi, uh, pectoralis major, humerus continuous with the forearm muscles, and then uh, to the L line and through the copper tail and ends in the insertion into the palmar surface of the fingers. So, uh, very important structure in our clinical, uh, you know, understanding because. A lot of people come to us with, you know, tingling sensation in the hands, you know, pain radiating from the chest and pain throughout this area and just specific to the fascia. And uh, they come and tell us, you know, like uh, conditions like carpal tunnel syndrome. So uh, we all know that what is the reason for carpal tunnel syndrome? People say it's use of uh, computer or mouse. But even uh, house housewife or people in the house, you know, they, even they come with, a condition like this you know and there's a lot of sim so you can see that you know a trigger point from this chest actually connects with the trigger points in in the forearm and you know that in turn gives symptoms that similar to like ctus in your arm so uh, whenever we treat a patient you know we focus more on this area but the idea is that you know this area you know, is something that we not uh, look into or so much talk about because we need to find the issue this is what is called as a symptom and we need to find the root cause of it which is you know uh, along that particular facial chain next we we'll talk about you know the deep front arm line uh, a very important structure Attendees, please mute your mic. Does, does the host have the, uh, is there an option called mute all? I mean. The host, do we have the uh, power to mute all? Because it might be a mistake they have just it and they don't realize it. Yeah, I think it's okay now. Okay, so uh, another important, this is the deep front arm line. You know, it begins with the pectoralis minor muscle, continues with the biceps femoris and then to the um, and to the uh, thin arm. So what happens is a very common condition that we see like, you know, DQ vein, tenosynovitis, you know, it's common today. And uh, see, we need to understand this principle. Now, I'm not saying that, there is no condition called as carpal tunnel syndrome. There is no condition called as, you know, DQ events. That is not the idea. What I'm trying to say is the issue with these facial lines also gives symptoms that is very close to 
you know, a carpal tunnel syndrome or, or a DQ and sentinocyanomatis. So before people, you know, uh, and mostly it's a, the only option is surgery for these two conditions. So before, you know, them going to the surgery, uh, you know, if we understand these concepts and if we try to treat them uh, with underlying understanding these conditions, you know, uh, you can save a lot of people from actually you know, doing surgery. Superficial back arm line, you know, the upper trapezius uh, to your deltoid, to the triceps, to the extensor muscle group, and then very common, you know, when people have uh, pain here and stiffness here, and then they give you like, you know, just behind the posterior deltoid and the extensor, a lot of pain. And then they have uh, like, you know, conditions and numbness and you know on the fingertips and the condition they complain is like you know especially women they're not they're not able to hold uh, you know vegetables when they're trying to cut and you know and they give they get a lot of uh, numbness and pain and comfort discomfort so uh, we, we yes it, it, it is a neurological condition but we need to understand that you know all neurological conditions the origin may not be from uh, the spinal cord or the spinal, you know, it, it could be because along the way, we need to understand the nerve actually passes through these muscles and these facial connections. So there could be a compression or, you know, uh, in or stiffness in any of the fascia that is compressing these nerves and it is actually, uh, you know, causing a dysfunction in the nerves and giving conditions that is uh, similar to the condition exactly when, they ha when that is affected in the uh, spinal column as well. And then you have the deep back arm line, you know, a very typical condition that you see, like, you know, uh, the rhomboids is affected, the sclospenitis is affected, trapezius, and then, uh, you know, which gives like neuritis and ulnar neuritis conditions. Uh, all these, it's, it's very common in, in uh, people these days, you know, they come to us because this part, the cervical, upper back, very common. And, uh, you know, this is another, the spiral oblique chain. We need to understand the different connections and how it is all interconnected. And, you know, one, uh, one particular trigger point which leads to an imbalance in the entire uh, posture. So if the person's posture is different, we can try to analyze which muscle, which group, uh, which facial chain, uh, which myofascial meridian we need to work on, et cetera. Uh, the lateral chain, you know, it's not the anatomy trains itself is a huge subject, but I'm just I'm just going to give you a small, you know, spotlight into very important things. And uh, the posterior sagittal chain, it's a very useful, uh, you know, myofascial meridian for us. It begins at the occipital frontalis, right? Just above your eyebrow, you know, it begins uh, on the, the my, myofascial begins here and then goes along the back, the erector spinae to the thoracolumbar fascia, you know, along the multifidus, the sacrotubulus ligament to the biceps femoris, and then it's continuous with the gastronemius, and then it continues with the plantar fasciae. So, very common condition, plantar fasciitis, and uh, this is also uh, one of my favorite myofascial meridians because it is here that we can prove the effect of uh, Murda Thaila, how Murda Thaila affects and how the uh, how wrong uh, usage of Murda Thaila gives a lot of complications. And in today's scenario, uh, you know, 99% of the headaches that I see uh, in my clinic, you know, it's, it's related to this. People are complaining with plantar fasciitis. Uh, yes, in my initial days of my practice, you know, right after BMS, the first thing I started doing was uh, Rekta Mokshna and Agni Karma. And I was getting a lot of results in, in plantar fasciitis. And, uh, but now I realize that, you know, even though uh, people compa complain with pain in the fascia uh, and in the plantar area, uh, it could be, uh, you know, tightness of the muscle of the gastronemius. It could be a muscle of the biceps femoris, you know, the, the hamstring, or it could be an issue in the low back, or it could be an issue in the head. And that is why sometimes when you give proper oil when we prescribe proper oil uh, you know that actually helps heal uh, you know plantar fasciitis and it's the same uh, effect when when you use like a wrong oil it also gives symptoms like you know uh, plantar fasciitis so uh, 
nowadays i re very rarely do agni karma on the plantar area for plantar fasciitis because uh, you know there are other things like i use trigger point therapy and i and i usually treat the uh, calf muscles or the you know the biceps femoris or the hamstring group of muscles because and i'm getting results there itself so next is the posterior oblique link you know uh, you could see how latissimus dorsi and how the gluteus and the it band is connected you know and th this sort of technique is usually used by what do you say the marma practitioners you know there is something called as a marma cross massage and you know this this is how we get a lot of answers about marma you know i think and uh, we, we also need to understand that there are certain conditions if there is a stiffness in your glutes here like you know gluteus mass or if there is a stiffness in the it band which can also lead to a pull along this line and then sometimes even restricting the movement of the latissimus dorsi so if you need to lift your hand completely right uh, there is uh, there need to be uh, what is a contraction of the latissimus dorsi as well and then we need to put your hand down it should be relaxed so when there is tightness in the latissimus dorsi sometimes this is affected so when there is tightness in the gluteus muscle you know it could also lead to uh, impairment in your shoulder movement as well so that is how the fascia is connected and uh, something that i've always learned like you know uh, local uh, sneha and swedana like you know the abhyanga local abhyanga and swedana is something that we need to be very careful because once we once you understand you know the fascia and its all implications you know you realize that you know local how why you know local abhyanga and local you know swedana sometimes does not give the desired result or just gives us some uh, you know relief but sometimes people come back again with the same complaints so here's how we uh, we approach the body in a more of a holistic way uh, you know when when you're treating headaches you're considering the leg when there's a uh, you know a pain in the leg you're considering the head so that's how it is all interconnected right and here's exactly how uh, you should you we will get a lot of answer uh, you know when we talk about marma the deep anterior chain another very important muscle and you know this is what the sports personalities you know sports physios sports osteopath and this is what they mainly focus into the core muscles right uh, you have this when there is continuous sitting you know the, there is uh, overuse of these muscle it becomes tight and it affects your posture and also the entire uh, function of, of the organs that is surrounding it so just to give you a small uh, you know a highlight into what all things that you can explore and you know how you can connect everything so when you talk about you know the trigger points you need to talk about muscles you know we need to understand there are basically two type of muscles and here's how we connect everything right uh, type one muscles are mostly postural muscles and uh, you know they tend to respond stress overuse and become uh, a trigger point in the muscle with a high percentage of a type one fibers may take longer to respond for treatment so what that does mean is that you know when we are doing uh, standing for continuously when we are doing a uh, long work like you know long hours of sitting you know when there is a continuous the muscle the type one muscle fibers are basically postural muscles and when there is a issue in the postural muscle they take longer to heal right and type 2 muscles are that is built for explosive short term activity and a trigger point in a muscle with a high percentage of type 2 fibers may respond more rapidly to the treatment so whenever there is uh, you know a, trigger, a muscle a trigger point in a type 2 muscle fiber what happens is it is easier to heal and it is easier to treat but a type 1 might take longer so when you're, uh, this is how what happens when you have like teachers coming to you after uh, you know the exam duty because they'll be standing for a continuous uh, you know three hours uh, you know and they suddenly they're complaining of back pain they're complaining of shoulder pain uh, so we need to understand you know what sort of posture this person has you know what sort of work he does uh, he or she does and you know and uh, what is causing this pain so for us the most important aspect is nidana parimarjana which means we need we need to understand what is the nidana so if 
posture is an issue we need to educate people about maintaining proper posture we need to uh, educate people about doing proper exercises and stretches right just uh, the postural muscles you have the deltoid pectoralis major rectus femoris in the anterior and the posterior yes gastrocnemius biceps femoris all these are our muscles you know it's very important very important when you're considering the posture right and there could be an imbalance in any of these muscles and you know overuse of any of this and which gives you a specific posture right and when we talk about posture we need to understand what is a good posture and like i had said earlier we talk about darsana sparsana and prasna so when and and, and in darsana pariksha when you're being when you're an osteopath you know we try to analyze the posture the way this person stands the way this person and we also look for the gait you know where the way he walks and the gait is not for just neurological conditions but also we can find you know the imbalance in the muscles as well using the gait so what is a good posture and what is the test for it you know we have what is called as a, a plumb line test you know we hang a thread right and uh, and there is we put a weight under it right and we ask the person to come and stand next to this thread you know where uh, the the weight will be in line with the lateral malleolus right so in a perfect posture we can see that the thread will pass from the external auditory meatus to the acromion process you know just in front of the elbow the greater trochanter just behind the patella and to the lateral malleolus and now if this person if a person uh, posture is not in this line then we should understand you know we should try to understand where, where there is imbalance where there is for you know it could be a rounded shoulder it could be a protracted uh, you know retractor or protracted back anything it could be a uh, kyphosis it could be low doses you know and uh, hyper extension of knee you know, a lot of conditions so we need to understand where there is a dysfunction and then work accordingly and there is a very close link between trigger point formation and posture and uh, as you can see uh, the posture study was done by yanda the spelling is j-a-n-d-a -A. you can go online and a very cross very famous uh, posture issue or dysfunction is the upper cross syndrome what happens is you know that the tight the pectoralis muscles become very tight right the subacrobicitral muscles become very tight and and this person and you know there is weak neck flexors and the weak rhomboids which means his there will be a natural posture becomes like this because of you know the imbalance in the uh, muscles and the another is the lower cross syndrome where the tight thoracolumbar extensors become very tight right and hip flexors become tight the, the weak abdominals and the weak gluteus maximus so it's like you know a, f a forward pelvic tilt and you know it's a condition sorry a, a backward posterior pelvic tilt and then people are not able to walk you know straightly you can see in elderly how they walk right so this is a natural uh what do you say a phenomena and how these syndromes happen so we need to understand more about it okay i'm getting questions i'll uh please post your questions in the chat and you know i'll i'll reply to it end of the session right head to one side occupational ergonomic stresses lifting and carrying it's very important seeing these days you know we need to educate people how to use uh you know uh, recently i got a patient uh you know he's a, a techie like you know computer uh engineer and and it's locked down he's at home he's doing a lot of work in his uh you know in, in in his laptop so he's been coming with pain you know in the t8 t9 level and and you know he's been very disturbed he he wants to know what that pain is you know mri is uh, nothing but then when you know i try to analyze based on this knowledge i understand you know his posture is wrong and you know he's been working on his laptop so the dangerous thing about laptop is that you know 
laptops are actually meant for small works that you know it's it's meant to carry your work it's meant to do some small presentations it's not really meant for hardcore you know computer uh, programming and things like that so when people use laptops for such things i always advise them to either use uh, you know laptop in such a way that you adjust the screen of the laptop just below the level of the eye right and use an external keyboard so that it is in line with your hands right so in a laptop the hand and the eye it doesn't actually match so you need to lift it up along eye level uh, and then use it and with that you know you could see a lot of people we need to educate our patients because uh, nowadays what happens is you know there's so much of uh, online classes you have kids coming there's a lot of online work being done and you know people are prone to this condition so uh, they keep coming back to us for pain we need to relieve it we need to understand we need to tell them what good posture is the second is lifting carrying i'm sure you know we need to understand we need to teach them that you know it's always safe to bend your uh knee when lifting and you know again like i mentioned uh, use of uh, laptops and computers and probably so slouch standing slouch sitting sway back posture cross leg sitting and habitual postures you know uh, very common people come and sit with cross postures and cross leg you know portions and you can see that uh, you know they are so used to that posture that whenever they sit they can only uh, sit with cross leg they cannot uh, you know they cannot sit in any other posture because it is a, it becomes a habitual posture and then you know there is a compensation in your body in such that only those set of muscles you we feel comfortable only when you sit in, sit in that position right uh, again some different types of postures here you know hyperlordotic back there's hyperlordosis flat back you know this is someone like the lower cross syndrome and the sway back posture and the balance posture so it's important that we uh, teach our patients the importance and relevance of proper posture driving i'm sure everybody knows you know bucket seats it's something that is new gen and it is very very dangerous to your back right because you are sitting and the load is completely on your lumbar spine and you're prone to back issues and uh, we need to understand and we need to treat we need to give instructions to patients so when it comes to car drivers or taxi drivers what i always tell them is trying to use a cushion so that you know they increase the height and i ask them to actually uh, break their journey every 60 or 70 kilometers do some stretches walk around so you know there is no stiffness in these muscles uh, and uh, you know when we, once we educate people you know they really like to do follow things that you know will help them uh, ease in their conditions and also which prevents uh, them coming back so here is an example of the same person sitting in the same car but in a much comfortable uh, posture so again uh, while sitting the rule for a comfortable posture is that you know your hip joint should be higher than your knee joint so in this condition it is the hip joint is very low compared to the knee joint. Uh, here it's somewhat neutral, but it's still not correct. But when you're advising people at home, you know, I always tell them, especially people who are coming to me for knee pain, I tell them to avoid the sofas that are there in the house, you know, to sit only in uh, a proper stool or, or in a chair, like a dining chair where the height is proper. Right? When somebody sits on the dining chair, you know the knee joint is comparatively in a lower position than the hip joint and what that helps is when person stand up there is less strain on the knee joint and they will recover faster in case of handling knee so again uh, here is another video that i would like to share uh, please watch very interesting video all available online Prolonged sitting in a flexed posture, part one, biomechanical symptoms, lower body. Do you recognize this sitting position? Do you sit most hours of the day? Do you feel discomfort or pain in your upper or lower back?
What happens to your body when you slump in your chair for too long? Prolonged sitting in this position will in time cause rigidity and tightness in the tight muscles. We can see them colored in blue. These are chronically short muscles, what we call locked short. In addition to the posterior leg muscles, the hip flexors are also chronically short from prolonged sitting. Rigidity in the hip flexors is a direct cause of weakness in the antagonist hip extenders. Muscle imbalance. Muscle imbalances are the number one cause of lower back pain. What happens to the sacroiliac joint? The joint between the sacrum and the pelvic bones. The sacroiliac joint and the sacroiliac ligaments are under low. What happens to the lumbar spine? Here we can see a neutral spine and lumbar flexion. In prolonged slumped posture, the lumbar spine is flexed over time. Damage includes increase in posterior annulus strength, damage to the annulus of the disc, increase in intradiscal pressure. What happens to the connective tissues? Flex postures place stress on the posterior passive tissues. In addition, the posterior ligaments are also impaired. In the second part of the video, we'll learn the biomechanical symptoms in the upper body. So again, I hope that was also very clear. Uh, it is available online you know, when we're talking about uh, the muscle imbalance, continuous sitting, you know, very common today. So you can see how, you know, what are the muscles that is affected, right? A person who sits continuously, you can see the upper back, you know, the trapezius muscle, you have the sternocleidomastoid, you have the rectus abdominis, you have the psoas major muscle, you have the hamstring that becomes very tight, and the gastrocnemius type, right? And when this person gets up, you know, there is so much of force being pulled, and you know, he feels something like a back pain. And that back pain need not be because of the structure here, it could be because of the tightness in the calf and you know, the uh, the hamstring muscle. So, this is why understanding you know the chain you when you when when a person sits in a particular posture you try to visualize the chain that is involved you understand the myofascial meridian we understand which is the weak chain and then we treat accordingly right so all back pains may not be an issue with the back and some 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 persons who is having very stiff you know uh, a calf muscle pain or a very stiff gastrocnemius or a stiff uh, hamstring what happens it could uh, lead to a pull in your psoas measure as well and then leads to a condition what is called like you know an IVDB and innovative intervertebral disc collapse so uh, you can strongly say that you know surgery for IVDP is a strict no and is a waste of time there is no point in doing surgery for IVDP why because this is the reason uh, in, in, in condition like this where there is you know an IVDP and uh, you see people are you know suffering so much and even after uh, surgery you know the back pain is not relieved this is the reason uh, and in osteopathy the interesting phenomena is that you know the area of pain is uh, for the patient to concentrate and while you as a doctor or a therapist or a physician we need to find the area away from the area of pain to understand the main uh, reason for it right So this is how, you know, when people come to us with x-rays and MRIs, and this is how we see, we feel that, you know, the spine is, you know, in, in mental, you know, mental image of the spine is, you know, it is just stacked one over the other. But actually, we should realize that, you know, uh, I don't know, it's like, okay. Uh, you can see that there is, a uh, lot of you know structure that is involved in these uh, you know spine and how it is supported 
so for you know for us to learn and understand osteopathy you know there are a lot of techniques that you know we need to uh, do that we need to understand and you know how strong our body is and you know how uh, you know and sometimes in in colleges i think it is often taught to us that you know doing uh, deep stroking massages is a strict in uh, strict no in ayurveda and you know it's it, the ayurvedic massages where we close our fingers and then when we do in a slow motion you know the not a slow but a gradual motion we are taught the seven steps of abhyanga but sometimes when you realize that you know those seven ten steps are not completely enough in, in in handling some kind of cases because there are a lot of people coming with different issues so if you want to address something like a sciatic pain if you want to interest whether there's a tight hamstring muscle you know the the one of the, the prone position and doing a bhyanga or swaying in the prone position is not uh, is not just enough so we might have to ask the person to you know in a uh, in a lateral position with the flex knee and the flexed uh, hip right you know that's when we actually can uh, expose the muscles in the hamstring or the, especially the biceps femoris and you can do a lot of massage so you know those sort of te techniques is something that you know doctors practically learned by themselves you know over years of practice but uh, you know this is we need to understand uh, different concepts again you know just the basic thing and here as well uh, when you talk about so i've been talking about the structural part so far you know it's the muscles and muscles and fascia how disconnected and muscles fascia and bones how disconnected we talk about uh, postures how disconnected and then you realize that when this particular posture is affected I said, and here's how it gets connected because of the, uh, you know, improper posture in your vertebral column, in your spine, and you can see that, you know, it affects a particular organ and there is a function. So uh, with trigger points, you can see that, you know, there are conditions like uh, palpitations, you know, uh, when there's palpitation, you know, it could be because of a trigger point. Uh, if there is gastritis, you know, it could be uh, related to the area of the, when people are having difficulty in breathing, it could be uh, related to a muscular condition in, in, in a particular area, especially the chest, lower back, because people come to us, you know, when they, they say that when they're taking breathing, when they're breathing, you know, they feel so much of stiffness and there's shooting type of pain, or sometimes when they come, they, when they try to inhale and then they say, oh, they just suddenly get a pain. You know, there are a lot of conditions like that, uh, you know, people come to us. So over a period of time, improper posture leads to the improper functioning of, you know, the organs as well. So how the musculoskeletal condition affects the uh, organs as well. So that's why I said, you know, skelet, uh, this is the basic principle of osteopathy, that structure affects function. And even when there is a dysfunction in a particular organ, it also affects the structure as well. So... Uh, a very basic concept in uh, osteopathy what we do is you know we have the mobility and stability concept right so uh, i'm sure it's you know it, it might be a little hard you know getting all this together but you know here how it does so you have the toes have to be very mobile right your feet the ball joint has to be very stable your ankle has to be very mobile so if, if this is your ankle joint right if this is your ankle joint it needs to move and you know there has to be a proper mobilization of the ankle joint uh, the knee joint has to be stable right the hip joint has to be mobile low low back has to be stable upper back has to be mobile shoulder blades has to be uh, you know very uh, stable while your shoulder joint should be more mobile your lower and middle neck should be stable while your upper back should be uh, mobile so here's how we you know this is like a gross uh, information sometimes what happens is you know the the mobility in the ankle is affected when you know if the person has say like a supination trauma you know where the ha there is a supination injury it may not be a fracture it could be just a sprain uh, we do bandages and you know uh, and like uh, the first thing we do are like you know marmalade bandage or then we go for a muruvanna bandage and then we ask them to do exercises but what happens is even in, in a physiotherapist, if you go to, they only look for the range of motion. They, they come to a place where, you know, if there is, I'm talking about the ankle, they look for flexion extension of the ankle and then that's it. And because it, it is an osteopathy, we, we need to understand that uh, we need to make, we, we make sure that the entire, there is mobility uh, is restored in that ankle joint. Only then uh, can we say 
that you know uh, that treatment is successful because you should uh, when when there is a, a supination trauma you, you realize that you know the supination injury happens uh, there is also straining of the muscles in the lateral aspect of the you know uh, the the lateral muscles in you know the shin area especially your leg area so what that happens there is a strain so you also take care of the soft muscles or the and also we understand uh, soft tissue mobilization we need to make sure is also there and also we need to make sure there is mobilization of the ankle as well so uh, in a kinetic chain you know you have I, I just talked about the mobility stability mobility stability mobility stability factor we understand which is the weak chain and then we treat accordingly uh, for the entire body right so the rehabilitation process of this uh, you know this is first we do a posture assessment then we do a movement assessment like the overhead squat or a gate and then we check for the range of motion and then we understand where there is an uh, imbalance we understand where there is a dysfunction and then we treat accordingly right uh, so what is the correction uh, we first do a soft tissue mobilization the techniques that we do are sports cupping smr uh, iastm flossing technique to the point three i'll just uh, talk about it so sports cupping i'm sure very famous you know michael phelps uh you know the the olympics uh, swimming team in the usa you know they they the sports osteopath are using uh, cupping therapy as a very important effective tool in you know in recovery uh, and this was uh, you know michael phelps and you can see the and a lot of people feel that these are hijama no this is not hijama because these are just dry cupping hijama is completely a different uh, you know science and it's completely different method so this is just dry cupping and it the uh, it's based on the principle of osteopathy and you know uh, and muscles and you can see another swimmer with a lot of cupping marks because they it, it helps in the healing of this see that's michael phelps himself with those cupping sets you know uh, another bodybuilder you know a lot of people are into bodybuilding to relieve the stiffness and because there's a lot of uh, stiffness and lactic acid build up right so it's not easy to recover from all this with cupping sets right and then you have the uh, smr is nothing but the self my official release right uh, where you understand when you involve the fascia and then you try to stretch the fascia by with some breathing techniques etc uh, these are the trigger point tools that they use you know just trying to finding those trigger points or finding those facial knots or the facial additions then you're using a machine to actually just to slide it over that particular area these are the self-help tools that is available in the market today you know the foam roller uh, uh, what do you say? A uh, ball, a massage stick. You know, it's, it, it is all very, very uh, uh, self-healing techniques that is available today. Muscle roller, very effective, and you know, uh, athletes are are carrying these things always with themselves because you know it is such a very effective. Are you with me? Is am I audible? Can somebody reply? Yes, okay, okay, thanks. Because I was getting a message about my internet connection being weak and all that, so I just want to make sure I was there. So, uh, you know, these are massage rollers, very, very effective. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, I have this in my clinic. Some In some conditions, you know, I use it. Uh, you can do it with the clothes on. You can do it, you know, on a patient, and, and it's very effective. If it's just uh, simple conditions like the sore muscle, you know the stiff muscle and you know it is very effective and uh, next is this is the foam roller a lot of said you know you just go to youtube foam roller techniques and self-help techniques you know sports persons uh, you know they use all this on themselves because you know they can do it without the help of a physio you know there are common areas of strain that they feel and they need uh, to recover faster and and you know they study uh, this is an you know another a compression technique using two balls you know uh, relieving the uh, sto soreness or stiffness in the gastrocnemius muscle. This is what is called as an IASTM, the Instrument Assisted Soft Tissue Mobilization. 
So in the Shipra series, you know, we started with cupping. Uh, the next thing we are going to teach is about trigger points. And probably after trigger points, we'll, talk, we'll do a session on uh, the IASTM as well. Very important, very useful technique. You know, you just uh, scrape it, uh, you know, uh, you understand where there is facial additions and when you use this tool and almost instantaneously, you know, it just relieves the stiffness in that area. And, you know, patient feel that difference in their, you know, posture in their range of motion almost immediately. This can be done in an OP basis. This can be done along with your IP treatments and it only helps to uh, get to the results even faster, right? This is what is called as a flossing technique. Flossing is basically a band. It's an elastic band, right? Uh, you squeeze it, you know, you tie it around and then you do uh, passive or active exercises uh, in all in the muscle and which actually compresses and then in, in it just decompresses the fascia and the muscles and helps in relieving those soreness or stiffness in the muscle. And K-taping is something that, you know, a lot of physiotherapists do. What it happens is, you know, you stretch the uh, skin in that particular area and you put the tapes on, you know, the, the, the skin is in connection with the fascia. And when you put the tape on, you know, the fascia remains stretched, thereby aiding uh, circulation and improving circulation and healing in that particular area. So once we do a trigger point release using all these techniques, you know, once you do a myofascial release, then the next is what we call as stretching. You need to do proper stretching. And once we do a proper mobilization techniques with, you know, the, first there is a soft tissue mobilization and then there is the joint mobilization technique. So here is a small video of uh, me demo on the osteopathic thrust techniques. So once you treat the muscles, you know, once you release the muscles, there might be some correction that is required in, in the... Uh... Here's adjusting the C3, C7. Because what happens is when there's tightness in the muscles, you know, even in the vertebral, you know, it gets stuck, the facets get stuck. So we need to sometimes release it with these thrust techniques. They are very safe to do when you learn the proper technique. There is no much uh, physical uh, strain or physical force involved. It's just pure technique. Uh, correcting the L1, L2 area. This is called the high velocity, low amplitude technique. High velocity because it's very fast and low amplitude because there is very less movement in that particular Correction. That's it. Assessment and hip correction. So by understanding the various, you know, osteopathy thrust techniques, you can actually adjust all the joints, and it is very effective. Once you started applying this, also in your clinic. No, it's completely a different uh... so once we do uh, a, you know that's how we go you go into a soft tissue mobilization and then we go to a joint mobilization and you know there is uh, also you can also do a thrust technique that I just showed you a demo of then there is this power band technique right it's called a mulligans technique they use these power bands and then when we do motion and then we correct the joint. This takes a lot of time and you know that's why uh, uh, sometimes depending on the injury you know we might have to do this as well. So this is what is called as mulligan's technique, right? Joint mobilization technique. So you're just fixing the joint and then uh, increasing and you know uh, improving its function by using passive or active techniques. So, finally coming back to where we all started from Ayurveda. Now, uh, all these techniques and all these things that I showed, you know, one thing that we all need to understand is, you know, this, this all can be and should be done 
uh, you know, along with our practice. And, I, and in no way I would actually suggest people that, you know, we should actually uh, substitute, uh, you know, this with Ayurveda or something. It, it, it's not like that. Because what I felt that, you know, when, when an Ayurvedic doctor understands this kind of trick, uh, you know, techniques and osteopathy science and how it's involved, you know, our, uh, because we have tools like Marma, we have tools like Abhyanga, we have tools like, you know, Portlis and, you know, different types of Dara, etc. Uh, you know, you will change on how we can apply all this, you know, in, in what direction, which muscle, you know, and as doctors, we can be more specific with our treatment. So it gives a lot of advantage in, you know, managing conditions. So techniques of manual manipulations, you know, stehna, swedana, mardana, pirana, and veshna. You know, it's very simple, you know, and pirana is mentioned, it says deep pressure without oil, right? And uh, we are often told not to do deep massages. Lepna, Krasana, Agni Karma, Suji Barana, and Rektamokshana. Even, even when Suji Barana is mentioned, Suji Barana could be because uh, earlier they used to use some sharp objects or pointed objects to release these knots or muscles. We never know what it was, but you know. And now there is a lot of research and there is a lot of improvement in this science, and they've developed what is called as a dry needling. They've included, like, you know, a, a, a acupuncture needle which can be done and you know heal trigger points and various conditions of the muscle so a very famous sloka that we all learn you know ekam shastra madhyano navidya sarkanasyam tasmat bahasrudha shastra vijayani vajikati it means uh, by the study of a single shastra man can never catch the true import of the science therefore a physician should study as many allied branches of science and philosophy because only when we explore you know you know uh, out of our world or out of our zones only then can we better understand our science so i would clearly say that the more i learned about trigger point the more i learned about cupping the more i learned about you know various osteopathy techniques you know i was uh, understanding more and more about what actually was mentioned in our shastras and uh, it's the same that i have been trying to you know spread through various workshops and things so let's uh that, that's all the presentation. We can go to questions. Uh, yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a, it's I, a I, wonderful I, session. I know yeah, it was like quite big because, you know, uh, 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 osteopathy in itself is a five year course, and I've been given a space of one and a half hour to actually present it. So I don't. Uh, it's just you know basically uh, the idea is to understand these topics and trying to learn you know if it's cupping you learn about cupping you learn about ISTM you learn about it then you learn about trigger points you learn, learn about you go for face shading you need to understand about it right? so uh, can we do a couple of people uh... yeah whether you can do a bhyanga as in the pattern of myofacial meridian, Dr. Vishnu K. Vijay. Yes, you know, we can definitely do, uh, you know, a bhyanga, but we need to be very thorough about the myofacial meridian. We need to understand exactly what are the structures. It all depends on your diagnosis. You know, if your diagnosis is very uh, proper, then I'm sure you can do it. We can do cupping on the trigger point, dry or wet cupping, and what is the action uh, of dry needling on trigger points. Now, what happens is, you know, uh, actually, there are different techniques that we use in taking a trigger point. You know, a compression technique, you know, dry needling. Uh, is something new? Okay. Uh, you have the compression technique, you have the dry needling technique, you have the cupping technique. So, it varies according to which area you want you know suppose, suppose if it's like a sternocleidomastoid right uh, you don't really do a lot of dry kneeling there it's better to go for uh, compression techniques right so it is based on the region it is based on uh, you know which area you want to do which muscle you want to address if it is like a very deep muscle you know where you can't really uh, use so much of pressure there dry, dry kneeling might be better so it varies according to uh, different, uh, uh, you know, uh, structure of the muscle that we are dealing with. 
uh, how do we know the trigger point of a person uh, yeah doctor uh, before that uh, I, I think uh, we can introduce the uh, session that is the trigger point session so you can uh, you can say uh, a few okay, more so, words yeah regarding okay, uh, the okay with, with the uh, ayurveda map uh, could you just show that uh, yeah sure 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 uh, we have started a Shukra series on pain management techniques and, you know, with Ayurveda map, uh, the module one was on uh, cupping therapy. Uh, the next module is about trigger point therapy. And then we will be dealing in detail about, you know, different types of trigger points, uh, how, you know, how we can identify them. Uh, you know, we'll be uh, not all, but we'll be dealing especially with the area of the neck and shoulder, you know, we will uh, show videos and demonstrations on how you can find out in each particular muscle and what you can do to heal it. You know, it'll be a very useful technique uh, tool in your clinical practice, right? Uh, you can actually start teaching it the very next day of the session. So it'll be a four-day session. I think it's starting on May 16th. Nine, uh, we're doing a four online session, right? And uh, you'll be doing yeah, yeah. the videos as well. Yeah. 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 Okay, and uh, okay. some. Uh, how do we know trigger point of a person? Yes, uh, you know it, it is about understanding the theory of trigger points. You know we need to do a small study uh, course on it. You know we need to understand what trigger point is. You know elaborately study about it. Yeah, clearly why can I not anger swelling? I think. Oh, that's was it to me or somebody else? Uh, I read the map. How exactly do we differentiate whether it is a um, uh, myofascial, muscular, neurological, bone, or joint-related pain? Uh, so it, it it is all you know uh, the basic. Like I said, you know when you understand trigger point therapy, there is uh, very interesting techniques that we need to do. We need to find out you know the compression techniques. We need to like I said, you reproduce the pain, right? So we need to understand what is a trigger point. We need to learn more about trigger point therapy and then uh, we need to uh, apply it. Paralysis cases in osteopathy. Uh, well, uh, I think the theory of osteopathy, you know, in paralysis, we can try to understand, you know, which, which is the areas affected, what are the muscles need to be worked, you know, on those aspects. But the ideal uh, treatment for paralysis is, you know, for the, uh, you know, wherever there is that, you know, it, it's for like the murda thaila, you know, that's the main area that we need to, or the murda jatroga area. That is the main area where we have to, uh, you know, uh, uh, take care of when you're doing paralysis. How to identify trigger points is marma points and trigger point are one and the same. So, uh, I would say there is a lot of uh, similarities in trigger points and marma points because I would say that, you know, people, uh, marma points, Marma points are actually that is you know the specific type of point that is there throughout the body and you know where people are uh, you know it's something that is over the years of practice that they have developed those techniques. So I think trigger point is also in a very early stage is more like a in, in, in that you know line and slowly. But when an Ayurvedic doctor does it, we can actually better link it with uh, marma and trigger points. So. How do you get to learn about learning different marma techniques? Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, the, there must be marma practitioners. You know, a lot of marma practitioners uh, who have specialized in it. I don't think it's available in any particular uh, colleges, etc. I think there are a lot of good marma practitioners. You'll have to go and find it. If there is inflammation on joints. Okay. Uh, all the techniques that I mentioned, you know, there is proper diagnosis that is required. So I'm not saying that, you know, you should go and do thrust techniques or joint mobilization techniques if, in case of like osteoarthritis or, you know, arthritis. Now, that's not the case. Now, we, we understand if it's a musculoskeletal conditions, we understand the level of inflammation. We give anti-inflammatory treatment, you know, you give Lepna, you want bandages, you can give, you can give internal medicines, you correct it. Once the joint, you know, mobilization, once the soft tissue mobilization is done only, then we go for a joint mobilization technique. So that is something that, you know, we need to diagnose and understand. So we don't blindly 
follow any sort of protocols, right? Any, 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 can we use a Brianga? Yes, of course. Uh, you know, like I said, you know, we, we're not moving away from the principle of Ayurveda. You can use the same uh, oil that you've been using. You can use the same Abhyanga. You can use Portly. But the point is where, when, how, you know, that is if you have a trigger point, if you identify the trigger point, you know, and then the method of Abhyanga in that particular area will be different from others. So we can be more focused on the uh, condition. We can be more focused on that particular area. Right? Which oil can we use? Doctor, oil is all according to your discretion. I mean, you need to, like I said, we analyze the prakriti of the patient. But you know, like the general things that we do, like you know, kotam chipa, divan, vandram, murvan, all all that. I there's no specific massage oils that I do. Like it's it's just the same thing. Based on the patient's uh, prakriti, you analyze the uh, prakriti, you choose the oil, and then you do. It's just a technique that varies here, right? So if uh, you know you can learn more about you know trigger point in in the coming class that's starting next week. Uh, is there anybody else? You know any doubts or any feedbacks is most welcome. What you felt about the session? Uh, I know it was maybe too fast, too slow. <laughs> you know too much of uh, uh, too many inputs in one go. It is not easy because like I said, you know osteopathy itself is like a four or five year course and. Uh, to get it all under one and a half uh, hours or two hours of you know session is very very tough actually. Thank yeah, you. I think uh, I think uh, our previous uh, uh, cupping students are the Shipra series one module, so they can also come forward to uh, uh, express their feedbacks or any experience after that after the session. Acupressure and trigger point therapy are same or different? No, acupressure and trigger point therapy are completely different. Acupressure, acupressure is based on acupoints, whereas trigger point is specific to the muscle. And there are some areas where it might just coincide, but it's completely different. Uh, what do you say? Uh, theory, it's completely different science. But having said that, you know, acupressure has acupoints, and then acupoints has meridians, and slowly, there's a lot of uh, comparative study going on between meridians and myofascial meridians, you know, because uh, those who have done acupressure or acupuncture, because they feel that, you know, the meridian does exist in the body, or just like how we have the nadis, you know, Eda, Pengala, uh, you know, all those nadis that is, uh, and those who go according with marmas and nadis know that, yes, there is an existence of nadis because it is effective. In people, and we see that effect in treatment. We see that effect when it is effective, when there is, a, what do you say, an imbalance, or you know, when when there is a damage to a particular area, and how it is affected. So there's a lot of comparison studies being done with myofascial meridians and uh, you know, merid acupuncture meridians, etc. Monica, guys, yes, doctor. Uh, uh, you know, it's, I would say this, you know, it, it is, uh, you know, in, for me, it was just one, one step at a time. You know, and it's been in over what, about like 10, 11 years, you know, I started, I first heard about trigger points from in, in one session and then I did online courses about it. And then I've been trying to practice it in my clinic and, you know, I've been, uh, teaching doctors uh, because I realized that it is such a magical treatment, you know, and we as doctors should definitely know what is a trigger point. So uh, once you understand trigger point and then you'll be able to relate to the other things that I have said. So, uh, you know, with all this, I'm sure it's too much to, uh, you know, soak in, uh, but this is something that you can, you know, make a list of, you know, how you would want to progress in, in future, like, you know, what are the things that you can study, you know, what are the things that you need to look for, you know, if you hear any classes about, say, cupping, just jump in, you know, trigger point, just jump in, and then you can see how it actually affects and, you know, it'll be very good for you in your practice, right? Trigger points and marmal points are same. Uh, it's the same answer, doctor. Uh, you know, it's completely different, uh, you know, in trigger point, it's all related to muscle, muscle fiber. 
whereas normal point is completely different so it's not it's not the same but yes there are few points few spaces where you know the marma points and the trigger point actually coincides but you cannot say it's the same for example you know just in you have the indrabasti right in you know in the center portion of your calf muscle right that's also a place where you have the trigger points of the gastrocnemius right and then you have the uh, you have a marma here uh, i forgot the which, which one was here it, it's called carcate column in in the vermology uh, I think Amsafalica or something. Yeah, Amsafalica mama is here, and it's almost the same thing as the middle trapezius uh, uh, trigger point. So, a lot of common or or you know coincidences between mama and trigger points, but they're not they're not the same. Okay. 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 Thank you, doctor. Is there uh, any uh, feedbacks? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Waiting for any. One not seven marma there's a three or nine. Yes. Uh, like I said, you know, it, there is. Uh, I would say it's completely different science, different areas. You know, I think it's better not to. When when you think about trigger points, just focus on trigger point therapy, myofascial therapy, and then you can treat accordingly. And when it's marma, you know, treat accordingly, and it has its due respect. But when you start with trigger points, the thing is you will be able to understand marma in a much better way because uh, for marma, you know, it is more like a, a, a theoretical knowledge. It's more like a philosophy and it's more like, you know, those points we need to uh, first blindly understand that, that here there is a point and then we need to treat and then we need to practice. And that's what happens, you know. There are a lot of marma courses and i see that there is you know like something called uh, thirumolar vermology in coimbatore they can they conduct a lot of classes and you know the uh, people are there are about 100 110 participants in every class they used to have and you know and when we go there are only hardly 10 people practicing out of it because uh, it's not very easy to understand the concept of marma it's not very really easy to understand the you know the uh, to understand what is a marma but uh, you know, once we understand trigger point therapy, what happens is, you know, it is like the very simple, you know, you we are to the point, you know, it's in a muscle, we are understanding treating the muscle. And then when we connect the myofascial meridian, then we see there is an involvement of structures and then we can probably connect to what is nadi, etc. And then once we understand trigger points and nadis, and then when we can refer marmas and we, you know how better marma actually works and, you know, what are the areas that, you know, uh, there are specific points for marmas and probably how it would have come so it is good to understand both that, that's that's the main uh thing yeah think, uh, that, that's about it yeah 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 we, we are going to wind up before that any person uh here uh for a feedback you can unmute and uh have okay so our uh, previous participants there i think uh, everyone uh, has left <laughs> okay uh, anyone there okay okay doctor uh, so thank you thank you for the uh, session and uh, uh, yeah definitely we can meet at the uh on a 16th yes yeah okay. point therapy yeah okay. Okay. yeah this, this time we have a good uh registrations hope uh everyone we can meet at uh on uh, 16th may 16th okay. okay thank you doctor thank you very much okay, okay. Good night, doctor. Thanks.